have entitled it today, Holy Self-Disclosure, because Paul talks about his own experience a lot in the second half of Romans 7, where we are today. But before we get into that, I'd like us to just bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you and praise you that uh, you give meaning to life, and you give us so many blessings, so much to be thankful for. And when we look at the amazing things you did in Paul's life, we see the same in our own life, that you've done amazing things to turn us around and to turn us to you. And so, Lord, we just pray your spirit will minister to each person today as we open your word together, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The story is told of uh, an 83-year-old woman who uh, visited Kingdom Life Fellowship for the first time, 83 years old. And... Uh, she got welcomed by the head greeter. I won't say who that was, but his first name was Roger. And uh, he uh, walked her all the way down to shore where the sanctuary was and said, where, where would you like to sit in church today? And the woman said, well, I think I would like to sit right on the front row. And Roger kind of frowned and he said, well, I don't know if you want to sit right on the front row, because sometimes our pastor's kind of long-winded, and sometimes even gets a little boring, and you know, if you have to get up or something, it could be embarrassing. And uh, she frowned at him, and she said, young man, you remember she's 83, young man, uh, do you know who I am? And Roger said, why no, ma'am, I don't. She said, well, I happen to be the pastor's mother. And I love to hear my son preach. And Roger just kind of hung his head and he said, Ma'am, do you know who I am? She said, No, I don't. He said, Well, thank God for that. And went back to the, <laughs> the foyer. But, uh, you can tell Roger's having an influence on me now because I'm <laughs> telling stories that are obviously untrue, you know, just like he does. But uh, Roger's a good sport. He can take a little teasing and This happened to be my mother's 84th birthday that we got to celebrate with her this week, so it made me think of that story. But uh, Roger puts up with me every week when we have lunch together, and I put up with his jokes and he puts up with mine, so that's quite a relationship uh, if you can do that. But I think I was asking Roger a while back, uh, do you think people are getting bored with this series on Romans? It's kind of a long series. And he said, well, I I don't know about board, but uh, I I don't think the church is quite overflowing with this series, and I had to agree with that. And I said, you know, if I'm going to preach on a subject that will fill up the church, I need to preach on the subject of, if you don't belong to our church, you're going to be lost. That's what the churches and denominations tend to preach that are really growing, Uh, If you don't belong to our church, you're going to be lost. You know, people, okay, I better get in this church then. Uh, The only problem with preaching that is that then I have to pastor a bunch of people who think that way, which I do not want to do. I would much rather pastor a small family uh, that has a more healthy spirituality than that. But uh, I was asking someone else about the series on Romans recently, And uh, they said, you know, the the most amazing thing to me about the book of Romans is how much Paul talks about the law. I didn't realize how much he talked about the law. And uh, that tends to be true. He uses the word law a lot in this book, including uh, our passage this morning, which is the second half of Romans 7. And uh, I want to start out there uh, by looking at Romans 7.10. Paul says, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. I found that the commandment, the law that was supposed to bring life, actually brought death. Now what's he referring to, the the law or the commandment that was supposed to bring life? Well, this is straight out of the book of Deuteronomy. It's straight out of the Old Testament. Uh, Deuteronomy 8.1, for example, says, if you keep all these laws, they will bring you life. Obey and live, 
disobey and die. This is a common message out of the Old Testament. You read Deuteronomy 28. The whole chapter is dealing with the blessings and the curses. If you obey the law, you will receive blessings. If you disobey the law, you will be cursed. And, um, you know, Paul talks about this over in Galatians 3.10. He says, everyone who doesn't fulfill the law in all things is cursed, is under a curse. Cursed is the one who, for all who rely on works of law are under a curse, as it's written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So this comes right out of the Old Testament, and we find it again in the New Testament, that if you put yourself under law, if you're under law and you fail to keep that law, you are under a curse. You are under condemnation. You are under death things that most of us don't want. If you're under law, you're under a curse. And the very law which brings life, if it is kept, brings condemnation, curse, and death if it is not kept. And that's the problem with us as human beings, as we are sinful human beings who do not perfectly keep the law. So it puts us under a curse, under condemnation. Romans 7, 11, Paul says, sin, using the law, deceived me and killed me. Sin, using the law, deceived me and killed me. Makes it sound like sin and the law are partners there, doesn't it? If you read 1 Corinthians 15, 56, Paul is even stronger in his language. He says, the strength of sin is what? The law. The law gets its strength to condemn us. Sin gets its strength to condemn us through the law. The strength of sin is the law. Wow, that's an interesting passage. Does this mean that Paul hates the law? Does this mean the law is a bad thing? No, all we have to do is read verse 12, Romans 7:12. Paul is not here to beg on the law. He says the law, and he's talking here about the same law, the same old covenant law. This law, he says, is holy, just, and good because it comes from God. The law, the commandment, is holy, righteous, and good. And again, this is the old covenant law he's referring to. So the problem isn't with the law, it's with sinful human beings who fail to keep that law, which is all of us. That's where the problem comes. Not with the law itself, but with our imperfection, with our sin, with our sinfulness, with our failure to keep the law. That's why we're condemned, not because the law is a bad thing, but because the law cannot solve our sin problem, it is inadequate. It has a flaw. That's what Hebrews 8, 7 says. Paul says, if the law was flawless, if this old covenant law was flawless, we wouldn't have needed a new covenant. So the old covenant has a flaw. And that flaw is that it can't deal with the sin problem. Once we fail to keep it, all it can do is condemn us. And in verse, for that reason, in verse 13, the author of Hebrews says that this old covenant law has become obsolete. It's obsolete, it's outdated. It will soon completely disappear. But um, the law still serves a purpose, but not for those who are in Christ. We don't want to put ourselves under the law when we're in Christ, because that makes for a conflicted existence. But, uh, you know, the law is still holy, just, and good in what it calls people to. And, and the ultimate purpose of the law is to show people they can't keep it and they need Christ. That's what the ultimate purpose of the law, of the old covenant law is. So it serves a good purpose unless people continue to put themselves under it after Christ has already come, after Christ has already provided a, a solution to the sin problem then we have a conflict on our hands. Romans 7, 
14. Now we're going to uh, move into uh, experience here. That I-, I wanted to talk about David for a second first. Um, you know, many times people quote David, hey, the law is a great thing. Uh, not only does Paul say it's holy, just, and good, but Paul says, I delight in thy law, I love thy law. And they think he's talking about the old covenant law. How do we know he's not talking about the old covenant law in the, in the Old Testament? Because he broke it. He broke it flagrantly. He was condemned by it. We have to remember that the new covenant is nothing more than Christ's perfect revelation of the everlasting covenant. The everlasting covenant has always represented God's perfect will. That's what the everlasting covenant represents. The old covenant was a concession. It was a concession to human sinfulness. It was a concession to Israel's unwillingness to enter into intimacy with God. So it's a second best model, if you will. It was never the ideal. The ideal is the everlasting covenant And the neat thing about David was he was an Old Testament figure who was able to transcend the Old Covenant and function with with God in intimacy of the everlasting covenant. And that's why he flagrantly breaks the Old Covenant law and is not condemned. Do you think it was a, a, a violation of the Old Covenant law to take the ark, which was supposed to be in the most holy place alone, only touched by a priest once a year with a rope around his leg, the high priest, in case he was unworthy and he'd get pulled out dead. What does David do with that ark? He puts it in the middle of the camp. He puts 24-7 worshipers around it so that God is being worshipped 24-7. And he invites everyone in the camp, including the Gentiles, to come and worship God before that ark. Do you think that might have been a violation of the Old Covenant law? I can assure you that it was, and it was the death penalty for doing that. Do you think it was a violation of the Old Covenant law when David fed all his soldiers the bread that was only for the priests? It was indeed a violation, and it was once again the death penalty. David was not functioning under the Old Covenant law. David was functioning under the everlasting covenant, the greater reality. He had an intimacy with God that far transcended the old covenant law mentality. And that's what God has called all of us to in the New Testament. Now that Jesus has perfectly revealed God, who God is and his will, we have no excuse for functioning under the old covenant. And there are consequences to doing that. Romans 7, 14. Our problem as sinful human beings, is that we are carnal, but the law is spiritual. That's what it says. The law is spiritual, but we are carnal. The law is not going to change. The law is unchangeable, the old covenant law. It's inflexible. Just like the law of the land is inflexible. The law doesn't change unless it's changed by legislation. But the law is inflexible. You might find a police officer who's flexible. I never used to find that. You know, I, I got stopped a number of times uh, up until about the year 2002. And every single time I was ever stopped by a police officer, I was given a ticket. I always heard about other people talking about how they got grace and you know, they didn't get a ticket and this kind of thing. But they were better looking than me or something. Because uh, I always got the ticket. And uh, it, it's really fascinating to me that just at the time when I finally started preaching that we're not under, under the old covenant law, even though I was still in Adventism and even though I got in big trouble for this, but when I really started preaching that, which was right 2002, every single time I've ever been stopped after that, I've never gotten a ticket. I, I, I should say one time I did get a ticket, but the judge gave me grace and said, no, that, I'm writing that ticket off. So I haven't had to pay a ticket ever since then. There have been four different occasions, which is pretty amazing when the whole life before that, I never once got off, I never once was given grace, and now even when I've deserved a ticket, 
You know, I haven't been given one. And I, I don't know that it, there's a direct correlation here between my <laughs> theology. But, uh, but it's pretty fascinating to me that that's been the case. And uh, it reminds me of the story of the uh, man who just got in this new sports car. And he wanted to take it out and test it out, see how fast it would go. And it was late at night, the freeway was empty. So he took this thing out and pushed it into second gear. He was doing 75 miles an hour, second gear, hit third gear, 120, hit fourth gear. But when he hit third gear, about 85, 90 miles an hour, he saw these red lights flashing behind him. But he just had to keep checking it out, so he took it up to 140 miles an hour and leaving the cop in the dust. And then finally he realized, you know, hey, I don't want to do this. So he pulled over, waited for the cop to catch up to him. And the guy was just incensed, you know. Why in the world would you run away from me like that, you know? And, and he was really angry and wanted to throw the book at the guy for exhibition of speed. And, you know, 165 mile an hour zone doing 140. You got to be kidding me. He said, but you know, it's almost midnight. I'm going to be getting off my shift for a two week vacation. If you can uh, tell me a story I've never heard before, I'm not going to write you this ticket. And the guy said, well, you know, I had a terrible divorce two years ago. Uh, the most difficult wife I've ever had. And uh, she ran off with a highway patrolman. And I honestly thought you were trying to bring her back to me. <laughs> the officer said, have a good evening, sir, and try to drive more carefully. But um, anyway, uh, we get into Paul's experience here, and it's very interesting because this is a super famous passage where he says, I do the things I hate. I find myself doing the very things I don't want to do. Oh, wretched man that I am. There's all these quotes from Paul's self-disclosure here about his life experience. And there are three primary interpretations of this passage. And the first is that Paul's talking about his past experience here when he says, oh, wretched man that I am and doing the things that I hate. Uh, the, the, Paul's talking about his past experience here when he didn't have the Holy Spirit, but then he got the Holy Spirit and he was still under law, but now he could perfectly keep the law. This is the interpretation of perfectionists. This is something I ran into a lot in my early ministry. And uh, it was used as a justification for perfectionism, that we can perfectly keep the law uh, under and be under law if we have the Holy Spirit. So Paul just didn't have the Holy Spirit before when he was under law, so he was doing all this terrible stuff. But then, once he got the Holy Spirit, still under law, he perfectly kept the law. And that's what we all need to do. Uh, that's a perfectionistic mindset. And that used to drive me nuts, and I hated that view so much that, of course, I went to the opposite view and said, no, that, that's ridiculous. Paul is talking about his present experience here. He's talking about the fact that uh, he still has a sinful nature. He's still in conflict trying to keep the law, but fails to do so. And, uh, you know, he's just talking about the conflict that all of us experience as Christians, trying to keep the law, but failing with our sinful nature. And that was back when I still believed that we were under our sinful nature after we're converted, that we're still the victims of our sinful nature. So the third view, which I now hold, is that... Uh, Paul is talking about his past experience here, and I'll tell you why I believe that as we look at these verses more carefully. But he's talking about his experience under law and contrasting it with his experience in the kingdom, his experience under grace, his experience in the spirit, his experience in Christ, which is not under law. So there's two huge reality differences here. Paul talking about his experience under law, and now, uh, and, and the reason that I think this, he's talking past tense here will hopefully become clear as we look at this. But let's uh, read Romans 7, 15 to 18. 
and then we'll start looking at some specific uh, parts of it. Romans 7, 15 to 18, come thou. This comes before that. Uh, I skipped a couple verses. This isn't their fault up there in the booth. But... Uh, <laughs> All right, we're looking for Romans 7. It's up there somewhere. Romans seven fifteen to 18. Here we go. All right. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is. It is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So there's several things Paul's saying here. First of all, he's talking about it being in his sinful nature. Okay? Does Paul believe he's in his sinful nature after he's born again? No. It's Paul who writes Romans 6.6, 6, in the chapter before this and says when we come to Christ our sinful nature is dead the old man of sin has been crucified we're no longer under that sinful nature this is Paul speaking so when he talks about being in the sinful nature and having sin dwelling in us and being under law he's talking about the experience before being in Christ before knowing Christ in, in the context of grace and, and the fullness of the new covenant truth. So, um, you know, he's talking about the sin that dwells in me. Uh, then he says in verse 18, I know in me, in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. Again, he's talking about being in the flesh. He's talking about being under law. He's talking about carnality. These things all go together. If we're under law we're in the flesh. If we're in the flesh, we're under law. If we're in the flesh, we're carnal. When he talks about being carnal, that's the same as being under law and in the flesh. He, he uses them all interchangeably. So he says, in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. Now again, we know Paul here is talking about his past experience under law because of the other things he says about his present experience. One, Romans 6, 6, my old man has been crucified. My sinful nature is no more. It's been crucified. Um, Ephesians 6, 11, I'm not at war with myself anymore. I don't wrestle with flesh and blood anymore. My only enemy is principalities and powers. That's what I'm at war with now. I'm not at war with myself. I'm not under the control of a sinful nature that condemns me. I'm at war with principalities and powers who are always trying to tell me lies and get me to agree with those lies. That's where the battle is now. And uh, 2 Corinthians 10.4, he says, the weapons of our warfare against these spiritual forces are what? They're not carnal. They're not carnal. They're not experienced in the flesh. They're not experienced in carnality. They're not experienced under law. So when Paul does talk about what is reality in the present tense for him, they are all things that contradict what he's talking about in the last part of Romans, of being under law, being in the flesh, uh, having a sinful nature that dominates him. None of that stuff makes sense in the context of what Paul says all throughout the rest of the New Testament about his present experience in Christ. So that's what we need to recognize here, that Paul is clearly talking about his experience under law here, having a sinful nature, being carnal, being in the flesh, and, and the conflict that that brings. That's what Paul's talking about in the last part of Romans. He's talking about the conflicted nature that is experienced under law. Even though you want to do good, you're in this constant conflict of condemnation, including self-condemnation, which will happen if you're under law. 
And then he goes on verses 19 and 20 and says, uh, I was practicing evil. Practicing evil. Again, that's in complete conflict with Romans 6.14. When we're under grace, sin does not have dominion over us. When we're under law, sin does have dominion over us. Even though we don't want that, even though we don't like that, sin has dominion over us when we're under law. So Paul is again talking about being under law, saying, I was practicing evil from the sin that dwelled in me. The sin that dwelt in me. Okay? Let's see what this version says. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing, practicing evil. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin dwelling in me, living in me that does it. It's a sinful nature that keeps coming up and biting me. Okay? That happens under law. That happens when we're not in Christ. When we're in Christ, we're no longer dominated by a sinful nature. We're no longer dominated by sin. So it's a very different reality. Romans 7, 21 and 2. Let's move on to the next two verses in our passage here. Romans 7, 21 and 2. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. So Paul's saying when he's under law, his spirit desires to do good, but the flesh is in control. The sinful nature is in control. The sinful nature keeps winning out against his spiritual desire. And that's the reality of people who are under law, whether they admit it or not. Uh, when I was under law, that was the reality. I didn't want to admit it many times, but it's the reality under law because you are under condemnation. You can't get out from under that because we have broken that law and that law condemns us. So being under condemnation has a, a major influence on us. Well, let's look at what Jesus says uh, over in Matthew 26:41 where he says to the disciples, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's talking about the very same reality that Paul's talking about here. The spirit is willing, the spirit desires the right thing, but the flesh, carnality, the sinful nature under law, can't get there. And that's why Peter denies his Lord three times. He's still under law. He's still functioning in the flesh. He hasn't yet experienced the baptism of the Spirit. He hasn't yet experienced Pentecost. He doesn't know yet what it means to truly be in Christ. So even though he doesn't want to do it, he finds himself denying his Lord three times in a very tragic way that caused him great grief and, and shame. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Then we look at Peter after Pentecost, after the baptism of the Spirit, after he comes to understand the gospel, after he comes to understand grace and what it means to be in Christ. Now he's leading thousands to the Lord. Now he's glad to go to jail for the Lord. Now he's glad to be crucified upside down. Jesus told him he'd be crucified but uh, he didn't want to be crucified as his Lord was, so he insisted on being crucified upside down. Um, but he did all this stuff uh, because he loved his Lord so much, but it never could have happened if he was in the flesh. Never could have happened under law. Never could have happened in his carnality, which is what happened when he denied his Lord three times. Again, let's go to the last three verses here. Romans 7 23. Paul says, uh, again, talking about his experience under law, that he was captive. Although I want to do good, evil's in me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work in me. 
Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I, in, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Okay, so right up to the end of this chapter, he's talking about this experience under law, under a sinful nature, being a slave to sin, where sin has dominion over him. Uh, right up to the very end of this chapter, he's talking in those terms. Verse 23, he's under the captivity of the law of sin and death. That's the old covenant law. He's captive to the old covenant law of sin and death. Verse 24, O oh, wretched man that I am. Would Paul say that when he's in Christ? Would Paul say that uh, when he's flowing in the victory of the kingdom, when sin doesn't have dominion over him? No, he's saying that under law. He's saying that in the conflict that he experienced under law. O oh, wretched man that I am. I can't find a way out of this body of death, this sinful nature. I'm completely conflicted. I can't find a way out. What a contrast to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creature. All these old things have passed away. They're no more, including the sinful nature, which has been crucified. That stuff is no more. Okay? In the flesh, I serve the law of sin. Verse 25. In the flesh, in my carnality under law, I serve the law of sin and death. Now I want to remind you that in Bible times there were no chapters and verses. Those came many centuries later. First the chapters, then the verses. But in Bible times all they had was the full book. That's why they had the full books memorized. When you quoted Isaiah, you had to have the whole book of Isaiah memorized. Um, and when we look at Romans 8, 1, and 2, we're not talking about some neat division that naturally exists in the Bible. That's not the case at all. Romans 7 just naturally flows into Romans 8. So there's no division, it's not a different chapter. None of that stuff exists as the Bible was written. So when we, I, I want to finish today with Romans 8, 2, because it's the natural conclusion of what Paul's saying here, talking about his past experience under law, under a sinful nature, in carnality, in this great conflict with sin. Now he gives us the two key verses that really open our eyes to the point he's trying to make here. And Romans 8.1, which again, did not exist in Paul's day. He's just flowing and writing right straight through here. He's saying, therefore now, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. All this stuff I experienced under law, all this conflict I had when I was under a sinful nature and carnality and the flesh is no more now because I'm in Christ and there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And, and then to make sure that we don't miss the point, he says what is said in the next uh, passage. He says, who are not under the law of sin and death. You can't be in Christ and still be under the old covenant law. The two things are inseparable. It's impossible to put these two together and have healthy spirituality. He's saying, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who have gotten away from this conflict, who have gotten away from all the stuff I've just been talking about under law, um, because we're no longer under the law of sin and death. We're no longer under this old covenant law, but what are we under? We're under the law of the Spirit. The law of the Spirit is the same thing as the everlasting covenant. It's the same thing as the new covenant. It's the same thing as the law of love. It's what Jesus calls us to as God's ideal for us. So when people try to say, oh, you preachers that say we're not under law are just trying to promote sin, it's just the opposite. If we're under grace, sin does not have dominion over us, Romans 6, 14. If we're under law, sin does have dominion over us. It does condemn us. 
it does put us into this terrible conflict that Paul's talking about in the last part of Romans 7. But when we're in Christ, we are new creatures. Does that mean we don't ever have any problems? Absolutely not. I think every one of us here would say we have problems, we have difficulties, we have tough days, we make mistakes, we sin. But sin under grace is something very different than sin under law. When we sin under law, it brings condemnation. It brings terrible conflict. When we sin under grace, which is a whole different definition of sin, sin under law is sin is transgression of the law. And we're all guilty of it. So we're all condemned under it. But in the new covenant, sin is whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. It's a whole different definition of sin. And the good news is there's no condemnation connected to it. I, I act without faith many, many times, so I'm sinning. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I believe lies of the devil and partner with those lies way more than I would want to. I, I can say the same thing Paul says. I, I wish I wouldn't believe these lies, but sometimes I believe them and partner with them. The good news is there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation connected to that. And condemnation is the deepest root of human misery and pain and suffering. So being under condemnation is a terrible thing that people don't understand how terrible that is. And that's what the religious spirit wants. It wants people being miserable in religion, miserable in their own self-imposed self-condemnation and condemnation of the law. That's not what God wants for us. He wants us to know the joy of being in Christ, the joy of being in, under the law of the spirit, and the biggest difference between the law of the spirit, if you're just going to talk in practical terms, and the law of sin and death, the old covenant law, is that the law of sin and death is all about all these things you can't do. It's all these long lists. Many of us grew up with that. You can't go to movies. You can't play cards. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't watch TV on Friday night. On and on and on it went. You can't play sports. One I didn't particularly love, especially on the weekend. But... Um, you know, all this stuff you can't do, and it's connected to sin. If you do any of this stuff, you're under the judgment of God and condemnation of God. That's not what the law of the Spirit is about. It's not what the law of love is about. Jesus says the law of love is about just loving God first and letting that love flow to our fellow human beings. Caring about people, loving people, not hurting people. That's the focus of the law of love, the law of the spirit, the new covenant law, the everlasting covenant. It's putting people first under God's will. The first thing we do is listen to the Lord and follow him, as Gary often says each week. Uh, and, and in doing that, we lead with love. We learn to love people. We learn not to hurt people. That's really what it's about. It's not a bunch of rules and regulations that people are always trying to figure out if you're violating them or not. So um, anyway, Paul's self-disclosure is very fascinating to me. I find this chapter very interesting. And my own self-disclosure would be very similar. When I was under law, there was always this conflict there, and I couldn't understand it. Why am I so conflicted? Why do I have so much anger? Why, why am I always experiencing this stuff that bothers me so much, and it had to do with being under law. And there's a freedom when we're not under law and a peace and a joy that can't be compared to being under law. And that's what I would call holy self-disclosure. God bless.